Amen. That's good news. The Lord never stops calling your name. Even when we fail, even when we struggle, even when we don't do it always perfect or don't do it right, God still calls us. God still showers us with love and God still showers us with mercy and grace. And I be able to understand that God's love never stops. God's love, the, the old saints would say that the love of the Lord endureth through all generations. It doesn't stop. Amen. Two quick announcements before we get into the sermon. I do want to remind you, um, all of our parents, we have Next Level for our middle and high school students on tomorrow at 7 a.m. So we want all high school and middle school students here tomorrow. Amen. We're going to be uh, having a great time at 7 o'clock. What did I say, 7 a.m.? Yes, not 7 a.m. It's 7 p.m. All right, so pray for me. Amen. I've been taking this new allergy medicine. It's got me a little off. So 7 p.m. Amen. On tomorrow. So we want our next level high, high school, middle school kids here tomorrow night. Um, we're going to have food, fun, and we're going to have uh, a little study. So we want to see them tomorrow night. Also, on this is uh, African American History Month. We will be celebrating all month. But on, on this Wednesday, we're going to be, uh, maybe the next two Wednesdays at least, we're going to be looking at a black religious life. Uh, we're going to be talking about the history of gospel music. So don't, you don't want to miss that. You want to come out on Wednesday and check that at that history on uh, the late, great Thomas Dorsey. We're going to be showing that during Bible study on Wednesday. So coming out because it is copyrighted material. We can't stream it. So you have to be in place. Amen. So y'all right, don't stay at home. I need you here on Wednesday night uh, to see that documentary on uh, Thomas Dorsey. Uh, I think you'll really like it. It's got some really great information and understanding about black history. And so I don't want you to miss that. Um, now, we read Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read Matthew 15, the companion passage in Matthew, and then we're going to go into the sermon. Uh, Matthew 15, beginning at verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from the vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer, did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, is it not right to, to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs? Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Verse 27 says, yes, yes it is, Lord, she said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. I want to minister from the subject, I just need a little bit. Uh, elbow your neighbor, tell them, neighbor, neighbor, I just need a little bit. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the word. We ask that you guide us, direct us, give us wisdom and understanding. Lord, we need to hear from you, Lord. We need a fresh word, a rhema word, a right now word for our moment and end for our situation. Now, bless us, Lord, in this moment and in this time to hear from you. Give us an anointing that makes preaching and teaching easily. Anoint us for this moment in time. I thank you, Lord, for the scouts. I thank you for the leaders. I thank you for all that is said and all that's been done up to this moment. Now, Lord, we need to hear a word from you. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen. I just need a little bit. When something is really strong, you only need a little bit. When something is very powerful, you just need a portion of that. When they make atomic bombs that can level cities and towns to the ground, they only use a few pounds of uranium. Uranium is all that powerful. When you need to clean something in your house, you just need a little bleach in that water because bleach is just that powerful. Years ago when I had a little cleaning and detail business, I, I had a solution that I got special. That, that It was so strong. I could only put a few drops in a gallon of water. Uh, someone sent me a cake the other week. It was so sweet. I told my wife, you just got to cut me a sliver of that thing. 
And that's all I need to be satisfied. Growing up, my mama back in the day, uh, we didn't buy orange juice the way y'all buy it now. We buy, we had to buy it back then and concentrate. Amen. That little can, I, and she would buy that can. We'd be in the store, and mama, she'd be buying that, that little can of orange juice concentrate, frozen concentrate. I miss, thank you, Miss Tennessee. I say, mama, that's not enough orange juice. She said, oh, yes, it is, baby. Yes, it is. Wait till we get home. And I'm sitting there saying to myself at five years old, that's not not enough orange juice, amen. I can drink that whole can by myself. She said, it's concentrated. I didn't know anything about that. She said, this little bit is going to make a whole lot. When we got home, sure enough, she put it in that little pitcher, amen, and filled that pitcher with water, and that all of a sudden now we had a pitcher of orange juice, because when sometimes when something is powerful and something is strong and concentrated, a little bit is all you need. Uh, when you're when dealing with something that's powerful, a little bit can go a long way. Well, beloved, the God we serve is so big. The God we serve is so powerful. The God we serve is so awesome that a little bit of God's power can supply all that you need. A little bit of God's power can change your life. A little bit of God's grace and a little bit of God's mercy can save you, deliver you, heal you, set you free. With a little bit of God's power, you can walk on water. With a little bit of God's power, the blind see and the deaf hear. With a little bit of God's power, multitudes can be fed and mountains can be removed out of your way. With a little bit of God's power, the dead rise in the lame walk. With a little bit of power, Jericho's walls came tumbling down and David slew the giant. With a little bit of God's power, lions will act like lambs and furnaces get turned in the air condition. With a little bit of God's power, big doors open at the Red Sea. With a little bit of God's power, amen, I couldn't, God kept me when I couldn't keep myself. With a little bit of God's power, I seen made, ways made and miracles wrought. With a little bit of God's power, I've seen lives change, marriages saved, bills paid, the sick recover, and hope be restored. What I'm trying to say is with a little bit of God's power, God can do anything that you stand in need of. With a little bit of his power, he's that big. He's that awesome. He's that great. He's that powerful. That if you just get a little bit of God, that's all you're going to need. Uh, in our text today, we find Jesus continuing uh, to teach his disciples about the true nature of the kingdom of God. And Jesus needs to instruct his disciples, not just in the classroom, but he needs to give them some real life experiences so they can carry out the mission that God has laid out for them. Jesus has taught them many things and they have a tendency, amen, like us, to forget what we were taught or not fully grasp uh, the weight of what God was trying to teach them or Jesus was trying to teach them. And one of the things that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples and needed to teach his disciples is the importance of the kingdom of God, not just for the believing Jew, but that the kingdom of God was going to be about the, everyone believing as well. The goodness of God was not just going to be for some, but it was going to be for all that put their faith in God. The gospel wasn't exclusive. The gospel was inclusive. It was for anyone that believed. If uh, the gospel was coming through the ancient Hebrews, but it wasn't exclusive to the ancient Hebrews. And so he had to explain that to them. This isn't something you're going to have to keep to yourself. This thing is so good, everybody can get a little bit of this. Everybody can get everything. Any God is so big. God is so wide. He's not an exclusive one group of folk, but anybody that believes can get a hold of God. And Jesus decided is to teach his, this lesson by leaving and crossing the border of Israel and venturing into Gentile territory. Uh, Jesus takes the disciples to the Gentile cities of Tyre, Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. And the ancient Jews wouldn't live there nor go into these cities. Um, so, but Jesus leaves Israel. In Israel, he wasn't always received. As a matter of fact, Jesus faced much opposition in Israel. But in the Gentile cities, he was warmly welcomed. In one place, he was seeing opposition and rejection in Israel. But in the other place, he was seen uh, being received. Amen. Uh, he, in one place, he was being rejected, especially by the religious leaders. But in another place, he was real, well received by those who the ancient Jews would call wild animals or wild dogs. The text says that Jesus entered into 
into this house in Tyre, in this foreign city, in this place where the Jews call the people wild animals and don't have much respect for them. But in this city, Jesus gets a whole lot of respect. Uh, and this is where we find him. And, and Jesus comes to this place, and he's not here by accident. He's not here by happenstance. He is on a mission. He's on an agenda. He's trying to teach his disciples something they can't learn in Israel. They've got to learn in a Gentile place. Uh, uh, now, Jesus, understand, is fully aware uh, that people are going to come to see him. Even though he's coming, he comes, people find out that he's there. He knows that they're going to come. Matter of fact, he has a meeting, an agenda to meet a particular woman that's coming with a daughter that has been demon-possessed. Uh, he knows she's going to come. He knows she's going to find out he's in town. He knows she's going to show up. And matter of fact, he needs her to show up so he can teach his disciples something they've been struggling to learn. Now, she doesn't know anything about this. She didn't know that Jesus had planned this way before the foundations of the world. She didn't know this moment it was ordained in time. But Jesus has plans to use her to teach his disciples something about the kind of faith that they need to have. Because Jesus is always trying to teach his disciples about the kind of faith they needed. He would tell them stuff like, you only need faith the size of a mustard seed. And that was enough to move mountains. So he would tell them, put their faith in God. You don't have to worry because if God cares for the little sparrows, uh, you know God cares for you. He even said, with faith, all things are possible. So Jesus was constantly trying to teach his disciples uh, about faith, uh, constantly trying to get them to understand what it means to have real faith in God. And well, they, they're still struggling, like some of us. They're still struggling to understand faith. They're still struggling with the faith lessons, the God lessons in the kingdom of God, lessons Jesus is trying to teach them. And they are in need of more instruction. And so Jesus uh, says, well, we're going to get out of the classroom and we're going to take a field trip, amen, as the educators say, to differentiate your instruction. Amen. Apparently you weren't getting into Israel. Let me try to teach you another way. So Jesus takes them to a place where they wouldn't think they would find great faith to teach them what great faith looks like. Oh, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. He's going to take them to a place where they don't think anybody has faith to show them what great faith looks like. Can I help you every night? now and then God has to use somebody that you think can't be used to show you what God can really do. Every now and then God's got to use the unexpected to do something that you never thought God could do. Every now and then God has to show you through somebody who you don't think anything of that God can do anything through anybody. Because uh, every now and then God has to humble us to show us how big God really is. Yes. Uh, so the Bible says that Jesus uh, 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 uses this foreign woman to teach these Hebrew men about what great faith should look like. It should have been the other way around. It should have been that these Hebrew men who grew up in the faith should be able to teach her something about the faith. But this woman who did not grow up in the faith now has to teach them about what real faith looks like. That's how God does it every now and then. He's going to use the foolish things. Uh, to confound the wise. Uh, the Bible says here well, that while Jesus is at the house in Tyre, a Seraphonician woman, a Gentile woman, a pagan woman, comes to him, falls at his feet, and begs Jesus to help her daughter who is suffering from demon possession. Well, her daughter's in bad shape, beloved. And in this moment, she's probably already tried to get help from other places, but to no avail, all of the other places she may have tried have fallen short. And so she finds herself at the feet of Jesus begging for help. Well, in Matthew, it gives an idea. She comes to him and says, Jesus, son of David. Now, that would blow your mind up. The Matthew text says that this Seraphonician woman, this Gentile woman, this pagan woman comes running up to Jesus, really basically declaring that he is what the prophets had said would be. He is what the Old Testament said would be. He is what the law said would come. He is the son of David, the root of Jesse, 
the promised Messiah, the anointed one, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. She comes running to Jesus with all the faith in the world and says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Hallelujah. This is, this is, this is crazy. This woman finds herself at the feet of Jesus, calling to Jesus, calling him by a messianic title. A Jewish title that meant the Messiah, the anointing one. She says, Lord, help my child, help my child, help my child. The Matthew text said Jesus was silent for a moment. And then that moment of silence, Jesus' disciples tell her, tell, tell this woman, well, lady, get on out of here. We're, we, we can't deal with you. The disciples only see a foreign woman, but Jesus sees his faith lesson in the flesh. Uh, Jesus Jesus is about to say something that would puzzle a mini Bible reader for centuries. He's about to say something that seemingly looks and sounds like an insult. I know that's how I read it when I first read it. I said, this is crazy what Jesus is saying to this woman. But there's a few things I want you to know. First, Jesus knew this woman was coming. And he knows what she's going to say in response to what he's going to say ahead of time. Number two, secondly, Jesus play, play, plays on the word the ancient Jews used to describe Gentiles. Gentiles were called, uh, excuse me, Jews were called Gentiles back then, wild dogs. But Jesus used a different term that's described, that's used to describe a household pet who would eat whatever everyone else at the house ate. Back then, household puppies didn't have different food from people in the house. They ate what everyone else ate. And sometimes they ate good food that the kids wasted and rejected. And some of us have pets in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Your pet eats better than a whole lot of folk. Amen. And sometimes our pets eat better, amen, than we do. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all do have pets. Yeah, I know. Don't even act like your pet don't eat chicken and fish every day. It's a play on the words with children and dogs to compare the children of Israel, that the children of Israel rejected the good food that God laid out for them, but the folks that the Jews thought were dogs were smarter and knew the food that God laid out for them in the form of Christ was to be well received and not rejected, but consumed immediately. So he's playing on what they thought and kind of teaching them what they should understand. Thirdly, Jesus does not, he never really calls her a dog. He just makes a metaphoric statement and lets her give the response he already knows she's going to give to teach his disciples something they need to know. He's not caught off guard by her presence. He planned for her to be there. He planned this moment. He planned this daughter to, uh, to come now and get delivered. He understood it. This is all for his disciples. The disciples think the Gentiles are dogs and he's about to teach them that sometimes dogs are smarter than people. He's trying to heal the he makes this statement about bread, children, and dogs. Uh, this statement is about the kingdom of God, but he just used a metaphor to tell it. So when Jesus says it, his disciples would only hear, guess what? The children get to eat because they think she's a dog. But when the woman hears it, her response is, but puppies under the table get to eat too. Oh, yeah, help me here. Look, Matthew says her reply is even that puppies eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Jesus then tells her, for such a reply, you may go home, find your daughter completely healed. Well, in Matthew, it records, he says, that woman, you have great faith. Your request has been granted. Well, what was the purpose of this encounter? What was the lesson that we're supposed to get? I'm going to give you four points, and then we're going to go home. Y'all ready for the points? Number one, great faith recognizes how powerful and how great God is. Let me say it again. Great faith, because Jesus said this woman has great faith. Uh, he's trying to teach his disciples what great faith looks like. They're walking around with the Messiah, and they don't even know what they're walking around with. They're, these disciples are walking around with the King of kings, Lord of lords. All Jesus has to do is blink his eye, think about it, and it shall be done. They don't know whose presence they're in. They have gotten comfortable with Christ. They forgot they're around the healer of healers, the deliverer of deliverers, the restorer of restorer. You got to recognize how big and how powerful and how great God is. This woman comes to Jesus because she knew how great he was. There was no doubt in her mind that Jesus was more than capable of fixing her daughter. And when you come to God, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 11, 
You must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You've got to understand how big God is because when you understand how big God is, uh, you won't worry, you won't be afraid, you won't be scared because you know God's going to watch over you and God has more than enough power, more than enough grace, more than enough provision, more than enough healing to take care of every one of your needs. She comes to him because she recognized how great Jesus was. And the question today is, do we realize how powerful God is? Do you really understand how powerful the God you serve is? When you realize how powerful you are, you realize nothing you bring to God is hard. Nothing you bring to God is impossible. Nothing you bring to God is too big. Nothing you bring to God is too wide. Nothing you bring to God is too deep. Nothing you bring to God has gone on too long. God can handle it without even blinking an eye. Number one, you got a great faith recognizes how big and how powerful, how great God is. Number two, great faith recognizes none of us deserve the blessings of God. Oh, uh, she knows she doesn't deserve anything from God, neither do the ancient Jews. But guess what? Look, none of us do. All the blessings of God come because of God's grace and God's mercy, not by merit, not by effort. We don't get the blessings of God because we deserve them. We get the blessings of God because of the goodness of God. Let me say it again. We get the blessings of God because of the goodness of God. You're not that good. You're not that cute. You're not that handsome. You're not that smart. No, no. We get the blessings of God based on the mercy of God. The choir sing that song. Even when I do wrong, God still keeps calling my name. Even when I sin, God keeps calling my name. Even when I fall short, God keeps calling my name. You know why? Because God's love, God's grace, and mercy extends way past any of your sin. It extends way past any of your fault. It extends way past any of your challenge. God loves you more than you'll ever know. That's why you don't get right to come to God. You come to God to get right. Amen. You'll never get right. You'll never be worthy. We're all unworthy. We all should have suffered. But guess what? The good God we serve, the loving God we serve keeps on giving to us, keeps on loving us, keeps on extending his grace. Even when we don't do right, even when we turn our back, God never stops loving us. This woman come because she knows the grace and mercy of God extends to, extend to her even when she doesn't deserve it. Oh, that's, a, that's number, number three. G great faith recognizes God will answer us even when we don't deserve it. Uh, this woman demonstrated what I call persistent faith. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus says we should always pray and not faint. Then he uses an analogy of a woman who went to a judge and had to keep on requesting that that judge would see about her. And Jesus said, even if an unrighteous judge will eventually answer your request, how much more would a loving God answer your request? How much more would a loving God see to your needs? How much more would a loving God provide for you? How much more would a loving God give to you. Understand that we don't deserve it, but guess what? God still blesses us anyway. Hallelujah. We didn't deserve it, but God still gives it to us anyway. We don't deserve it, but God still gives it to us anyway. He answers anyway. We don't deserve it, but he still answers. Uh, you don't need to keep, look, look, you don't keep asking someone for someone who you think can't do it. Y'all missed that. If you thought they couldn't do it, you wouldn't keep asking. You only keep asking someone who you know can do it. Great faith says, I'm going to wait on an answer and keep asking for an answer from somebody I know who can answer this situation. See, she keeps asking the Lord. She keeps talking to Jesus because guess what? She knows he can do it. Okay, y'all didn't shout like you're supposed to shout. Okay, let, 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 let me help you understand. See, see, uh, my kids ask me for stuff because they know I can do it. When, I, when they were younger, they would keep asking me for it. They, they knew I had candy. They knew I had pizza money. They knew I had McDonald's money. So they could keep asking because they, they knew well. Like they, McDonald's, now I couldn't take them to Flemings or no fancy spot, but they knew they could get a cheeseburger. 
So there was no need to stop asking dad because if dad was capable, even if dad did not respond right away, they could keep on asking because they knew dad was capable of getting french fries and a Happy Meal. Now here, can I help you? The God that you serve is more than capable of helping your situation. And so the challenge for us, uh, or no, look, so you can't stop asking because God is able. If you believe God can do it, why would you stop asking? This woman, she has great faith and persists in spite of the disciples telling her to leave, in spite of the silence that Jesus initially gives her. She, Jesus is silent. Watch this to teach his disciples that if you keep on asking, you just might get it. Okay, y'all missed that. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. Sometimes God doesn't answer you right away. Not because he wants you to wait. He's teaching somebody else that waiting pays off. Okay, let me help you. Sometimes you waiting on God, somebody's watching you. And they want to see what happens if you give up. They want to see what happens. If they, 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 they know you've been waiting on this thing. They, they know you've been praying on this thing. They know you've been seeking God for this thing. And they're not sure if God's going to do it. And so they're watching you to see what's going to happen. And every now and then, God will extend your waiting period just to teach somebody else that if you wait on God in due season, you shall reap a reward if you faint not. He's trying to teach some people, amen, about waiting on God. And sometimes God will use you. He's using this woman to teach his disciples, you better keep on asking. You better keep on trusting. You better keep on believing. None of us deserve it, but God doesn't give it to us because we deserve it. He gives it to us because we simply ask, and he's good. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, you, you, you should have shouted about that because somebody should be thinking about a situation you're worried about right now. Somebody came here today with a concern, and what I'm trying to get you to see is you need to just put that thing in the hands of the Lord. He's awesome. He's powerful. He's got more than enough to handle your situation. Well, you say, Pastor, hold on. Your sermon was, I just need a little bit. Where is the little bit part in this text? Where you said, you didn't say, this, you said the sermon was about faith, but the title is, I just need a little bit. Well, I was going to say, all you need was a crumb, but that would have given it away. The text says, when Jesus makes his comment to this woman, she, she responds by saying, even the dogs under the table eat from the master's table. Even the dogs get the scraps. Uh, even the dogs get the crumbs. Uh, this this woman, in a short period of time, in a few short words, summed up something the disciples had been slow to get. What she was saying was, uh, the God we serve is so big that even a little bit of what he's got is more than enough to take care of your situation. Uh, this God that we serve is so big, there's no need to worry, there's no need to fret. All you need to do is ask and keep asking until you get what you need. Because what this woman said, if you just get a crumb of what God has, uh, a portion of what God has, uh, all your needs are going to be met. This woman knew that a crumb-sized portion of God's healing could fix her daughter. This woman understood that a crumb-sized portion of grace was all that she needed. A crumb-sized portion of God's favor is so concentrated that it's all you're going to stand in need. A, a crumb-sized portion of the goodness of God is all that you need. The amount she was asking for, it was only compared to a crumb in light of how big God is. And she said, God, I just need a crumb. If you give me a crumb, my daughter's going to be all right. If you give me a crumb, all my needs are going to be met. If you give me a crumb, I'll be well satisfied. If you give me a crumb of your concentrated spiritual power, all my situations will be corrected. And beloved, I need you to understand, all God needs to do is cut you off a little bit, and that's going to take care of all your situations. Oh, you, you got look, God, uh, God, God can do it with just a little bit of, of his favor, a little bit of God's grace. It's nothing to God to fix your situation. You ain't asking God for nothing big to help you get that job. You ain't asking God for nothing big to reverse your situation. You're not asking God for nothing big to provide every one of your needs. God can easily do that. 
You just need to ask God for a little bit. You just need to realize you don't deserve it, God, but God gives it to us anyway. You just got to realize God is so big that a little bit of God, hallelujah, I thank God that at a certain point in my life, I got a little bit of God. Hallelujah. That little bit of God has lasted 30 years. That little bit of God is going to take me to the day I die. That little bit of God puts a smile on my face every day. That little bit of God restored my hope. That little bit of God took me out of depression. That little bit of God straightened my life out. That little bit of God put me right where I need to be. That little bit of God changed my life. That little bit of God has put running in my feet since 1987. That little bit of God has kept me jumping and shouting for the Lord. That little bit of God, all I did is that Lord come into my, save my soul. That little bit of God. A crumb-sized portion will change your life. Stand to your feet. Ministers, deacons, deaconess, come forward. If you're here today, I'm here to let you know that a little bit of God's favor whew, is more than you need. God has so much grace, so much mercy. It covers all of your sins. That's the shout. Covers everything. Makes you white as snow. If you're here today, you've never asked Christ to be your Savior. A little bit of faith can unlock the key. A little bit of faith. All you have to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. You don't have to know all the scriptures. You don't have to know. All you need to know is that you need God. And that little bit of faith will open the door to your heart. God will come into your life. If you're here today and you don't know Christ is your Savior, I want you to come right now. If you're here today and you need a church home, I want you to come right now. Is there one? God's got everything that you stand in need of. He's so great. He's so powerful. If you just take a little bit, it'll change your life. You put your hand in his hands. It'll change your life. Is there one? Come. Young man, young woman, senior saint, if you need a church home, come right now. If you need to turn your life over to the Lord, come right now. Don't wait. Today is your day. God has a plan for your life. He loves you more than you'll ever know. Come. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, oh, Lord, give us the faith of that, like that Gentile woman. The disciples should have had faith like that. But they needed someone who was outside of Israel to show them the kind of faith Israel should have. Oh, Lord, she speaks to us today. Lord, I pray that, Lord, we would have that kind of faith that understands that just a crumb is all we need. Oh, Lord, bless us now. For, Lord, you give us more than crumbs. You let us sit at the table. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, if a crumb is all we needed, how grateful we should be that you let us sit at the table and feast on you every day. Oh, Lord, help us to be grateful and thankful and help us have faith that recognizes how powerful you are and how awesome you are every day. Now, Lord, bless us and keep us in Jesus' name. And all the people of God said, amen, amen, and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Young adults, don't forget to go by the young adult table. Parents, don't forget to pick up your kids. High school and middle schoolers, we'll see you tomorrow at 7 p.m.